it. Okay. So, um, this talk is about uh, working with offshore developers. And yeah, I wanted to share my experience about that. So, um, the company I'm working for is uh, Drop Solid. Uh, we do solutions, training, and consulting. We've been founded in the beginning of the year, and right now we, um, we are with 10 people. We have two business developers, two uh, technical project managers, which uh, I'm one of them, um, and we have six Drupal developers. Um, me, myself, I've been a Drupal developer since uh, 2007, and I have experience leading teams since uh, 2011. So I'm one of the founders of Solid, and my responsibility is the, uh, the creation of the products and the services and the delivery of all the solutions we build. So um, why offshore development? Uh, everybody uh, should look at their company and, and, and see why they can use offshore development for us. Um, we as a startup um, we didn't have a team of developers at the start. Although I was a developer and Nicolas, who is also with us, is also a developer. Um, we also had a, a lot of work doing other stuff, um, like creating our trainings, um, developing our brand, establishing our company and so forth. So we didn't have the time uh, to do the development ourselves. So we used offshore development to do that. Another thing is that talent is hard to find and is also pretty expensive right now because there's a shortage. Um, another risk for a startup is of course taking on, on people uh, is a big risk in the beginning because if you, if you sell a, a project and you need uh, three guys and you take on three guys and then two or three months later, you don't sell a project, then what you're going to do, the impact is too big on a startup. So it helped us to control our risks. Um, so right now, uh, since we've developed our own team, um, since a couple of months, simultaneous with the offshore development, we could, when our sales pipeline started to become more stable, we could take on our own developers. So right now, we use the offshore developers to scale the surplus work we are selling. So um, that kind of changed our strategy of why we use offshore development. In general, established companies will use offshore development for scalability to handle unstable demand. There are shops that don't only do Drupal and get in a Drupal project once in a while. So um, building a Drupal team might not be the best solution. Um, it might help to cut costs, but you will see that it will only be a solution in the short term. Because good offshore development will also cost you money. And doing it for the price is not the only reason and certainly not the best reason. Um, filling the talent gap right now for companies also might be a, a help um, to use offshore development. Um, on the other side of the world uh, we are talking billions of people and not like millions here in Europe. So the population is, is a lot bigger and there are also more developers over there. So I'm talking then mostly about Asia. So how did we approach it? Uh, once we decided we wanted to do offshore development, how did we decide it, uh, who is going to be our partner? So we took our time to try out different partners and we tried out different shops um, with different rates. And I've worked as a, as a freelancer before and I've tried out a lot of offshore development forces. This time, there was a difference. We weren't looking for like one or two guys. We were really looking for a team. <coughs> so we needed a shop that had the capacity to provide a team. And we met uh, at DrupalCon Munich. We met Economy, which is an offshore Drupal shop focused on Drupal. They also do other things, but like 80 to 90% of their focus is on Drupal. 
So they had 20 Drupal developers. Um, and they were in Pakistan, which is only a time zone difference of four hours and three hours in summer. So that made our window for communication big enough to, uh, to look at them. Then we also looked at how third world issues uh, were covered. I speak about this because as a freelancer, I've hired some, uh, some offshore developers that uh, came up with the excuse, yeah, we don't have a, any electrical power, we didn't have any internet connection, so we didn't work for you. So the more established shops, they have solved that problem. They have accounts at multiple ISPs, they have backup generators, so these problems we don't have here, they, those, the bigger shops, they have solved it. So that's important because if you want to deliver your projects on time, they, they will have to be able to, to work and if they don't have any internet or, or electricity, that won't be possible. So then um, we also looked at the, at the culture. So you have different types of, uh, of offshore shops and, and also developers. Um, I've worked with developers who, who say yes to everything. So that's not the kind of developers you, you want to work with. They, they, need to, they need to be able to speak up. They need to be able to, to tell you when there is a problem or when you are suggesting solution X is not the best because this or that they have discovered during development because even though I'm a developer in the offshore um, setup, I was a project manager. So I'm not aware of every detail that's being coded or that's being implemented. So they need to be able to speak up and you have to allow your team to think for themselves. And I think uh, the shop where we work, the CEO has done a great job to, to install the mindset in these people that it's okay. Because their cultural differences are that um, the, the guy you work with is like, you do whatever he say. And that's not the kind of relationship you want to establish. They have to say no to you or they have to say it in a different way um, when you are busy uh, working on a project. So another thing is you should go to the long term. If you think like we have just this one little project and we want to do it and we have to do it quick and cheap, then that won't probably not be the motivation. It's about establishing a relationship because integrating your processes, and we'll see further in the talk that why integrating your processes is important. Um, and that takes some time for building the relationship. So the next thing is the, the team selection. What I found important by selecting a team is the first thing you should do is you should select the leader over there. So why you should select the leader? Um, you can give that person the authority to solve a lot of problems without having you to go in and communicate and resolve the problem. It will save you a whole, a whole bunch of time in communication. He will be your, your first line. He will be able to communicate your desires to the rest of the team and you will have a single point of responsibility and that guy will um, try, to, try to give the other guys work as he sees fit. And what's also very important when you are finding developers that you discuss the other developer profiles with that leader because he's the one who is going to lead them directly. So you're going to communicate with them as a project management, but the leader will have to take decisions. You won't have Skype open all the time, 24 hours a day or the time they are working. You won't be doing that because you, you want to be busy with other stuff. So you have to integrate the team tightly if you are using developers at your own company. So if you're working with your own developers and offshore developers, a very important mindset is that you don't create they have done this or that and we have to do this or that. It has to be clear for the team that there is one team and that they should communicate among each other and if there is a problem, 
then they should just communicate and not wait like yeah we did this and they did that that's not the way you should go if you, you work with mixed teams then the process um, you should also look at yourself if you have the necessary skills because it takes some skill to work with offshore developers um, the first skill you need is you have to be able to clearly conceptualize a project you need clear wireframes you need clear functional description if you don't have that you will find yourself doing a lot of Skype calls and you will have your tickets full of questions because they, if they do something um, they think is right, it might not be what the client wants. This is so basic, you should do it with your own developers as well. Um, not only with the offshore developers, with the offshore developers you can go further and write even more out on paper and make your wireframes even more detailed. It will help because um, the time you will win in communication will be significant. Then you must know how to manage a project. Um, if you don't know how to manage a project, if you just send the wireframes and the functional description and you come back a month later, that's not, that's not how you will be able to discover problems, how, how you can manage your project, make it go faster, uh, add more developers, add less developers, change people. You need to break up everything into tiny pieces. We chose to do the, the Agile way, so, and the team over there was used to working Agile. So we've created user stories, and we add the technical description, the functional description, we discuss it, etc. And then the third, I think you might be successful without the third one, but I think if you have the third one, then your chances for success will increase vastly. Because then you will be able to make the technical document and communicate it. You will be able to exactly architect and tell how the application or website should be built. So this leaves no, no more room for imagination and you will come to like uh, an application that you want designed to your standards that you are using in your company. So also if you are able to review the code you can really quickly <coughs> see what the quality of your developers is. It, it will not take you one month to discover that you have the wrong developer on the team or you have the wrong uh, hired the wrong partner. You will see in three days by looking at the code what kind of developers you have. So I think if you have these skills, it's without these skills managing a team at your own desk will also be challenging. So working offshore with the communication challenge, it's it's <coughs> almost necessary you have them all three. Then how how we we, we, we approach a project. So actually we just use the same method we use with our own teams. We use an agile approach, we start a kickoff, we go through all the wireframes, we eliminate all the questions, we take time, we do long Skype calls, um, we create the user stories together, the functional part, the technical part, we discuss everything, we clear out any questions, we do the sprint, sprint planning together, uh, we ask for input and here it's very important that you make the team comfortable so they can am admit the challenges and the risks they see. So you know upfront like this kind of implementation will be difficult for that team and at that point you have the time to like come up with another solution or add more experience to the team. Maybe if they are not able to do it you can hire a freelancer to do just that job. It's all about knowing what's going to happen and having control on how the project will evolve. And then very important is, is also you have to have them make estimations. So people should commit to something they decide upon. This will take me this much time. If they take like three or four times longer, you can see there's, there's a problem. Uh, you can discuss it. You can take action. It's, uh, it's how you can you can control your project, so you need to have them commit to uh, like their own estimations. 
So the daily development is we did daily stand-ups. We took the time, really the time, to handle all the questions because they don't have time during the day to ask this or that. Um, we also took the time to do the code reviews. We looked at the code that was being pr produced. We went through all the current user stories. And the key issue there is you really have to dig for issues. Like if you sense there's something wrong, go and ask for it. Um, give the team the comfort to admit there is a problem and you will be able to, to handle the issues. Um, every two weeks we, hand, we did a demo internally, two days before we went to clients, so we could handle uh, any extra work that was in, so we had a little bit of a margin. Um, actually, th these are just the, the same standards we use to, to manage our, our own teams. Then, um, the quality issue is always also a challenge, uh, working with offshore teams. Um, but I think the solution there is you have to build it in your workflow. So basically what we did, we hired a QA resource also at Economy to check each issue. Like each issue, each ticket has two rounds of QA. The developer starts to develop on it. He believes it's ready, it's going to QA. QA decides if it's functional or not. If it's functional, it goes to teaming. The teaming is being executed and then there's another round of QA especially for the teaming and the functionality. Using the wireframes and the functional document you can really come to a point where you get the ticket resolved and then the final stage where you have to like uh, approve with the client you can set it to close. But this actually building this into your project saves you a lot of time as a project manager. As a project manager you will not want to spend your time testing user stories developers created. Developers are the worst testers, so you should have a dedicated QA resource that is not part of your development team. Um, the, here, uh, a QA resource at an offshore development team is most of the time very cost-effective because it's someone who doesn't necessarily need the technical knowledge so it's definitely worth the extra cost. So the dedicated QA resource should test each <coughs> ticket. To do that, you need a, fun a good functional document and a good wireframe. So there is your point of quality. It de all depends on the first step, your own skills to conceptualize the, the project. So if you didn't do that right, the QA won't know what to test, what to do. So you need to do these things anyway. So I wouldn't see that as extra work. If you want to deliver quality, I think it's the only way. Then <clears throat> the tools we've used. So we didn't use any exotic tools. We've just used mainly Skype to do the communication, um, to do the meetings. And something that I would encourage you to use is you should always enable the camera on both sides just to see how people are feeling you know those guys are uh, are humans too so they might have a, a bad day that day or they might uh, have an issue or you know you should you should be able to like sense how the team is feeling so you can anticipate on that and it also works vice versa so maybe you're a bit stressed out or you have a client that's waiting for his project and wants to see stuff and they can also like sense how you are feeling and that you can, yeah, you, and that's really important for building the personal relationship because after a while if you have been working with these guys for, for six months and you've done, uh, you're on the phone uh, on, on Skype meetings like 10 hours a week with them then you, yeah, you get to know each other, even though you never have met in person. So I would really advise to use the camera. <clears throat> it will also um, eliminate misunderstandings. So for the project management, we used Redmine to create tickets, to document the project, to keep track of the issues, statuses, the sprints. You know, 
You just need a tool that is able to handle the basics, to handle issues, to handle statuses, to handle categories, have a documentation tool. It doesn't matter what you use, I think, you just should have those basics. And then we used email and calendar to make the appointments and yeah, communicate when, when, when you wanted to make an arrangement, etc. So very important is don't start to use email as a project management tool because it will be very difficult to pass a project to a colleague and it will be a mess to find out what exactly has been said so but once again these are just basic project management knowledge if you don't have basic project management knowledge it will be very hard to manage your own team so i don't think it's 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 where to start offshore development then um, we can talk about the tools we've used for development. <coughs> What's absolutely necessary is a repository. So if you don't have a repository, you will not be able what's being developed. You will not be able to, to see what code is being committed. Uh, basically, you will be in the dark if you don't have a repository. And the next tool we've been using extensively is a deployment tool. You don't want to go ask all the time, arrange Skype meetings to talk to your developers. Is it deployed to production? Is it deployed to staging? Is it this or that? Make sure you have a tool that can automate these things and where you can just go and look which version is deployed. And you can just see what code is being deployed. You you don't have to go, go in and, 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 and bother them. All these things, it's about eliminating uh, surplus communication because that's costing you. Your project managers, if they have to uh, spend hours talking to the developers on Skype about this or that, it's hours they can't use to manage yet another project. So use the tools to automate all that complexity so the infrastructure can take away a lot of these things uh, it's not that easy to set it all up but every decent development firm should have some kind of repository and deployment workflow in place if, if they they do serious project uh, development so what we also did was introducing code driven development um, for the non-technical people what that means is Drupal stores a lot of configuration in the database, for example, content types or views or settings. Um, you don't want your developers to go and do that on production or staging. So there are ways to uh, extract these settings into code and that can be committed into your repositories. So by doing so, you can exactly know what configuration has been deployed? You know everything. Everything that changes on your website needs to go through that repository. So if you wouldn't even see your developers just by looking at the code and looking at the deployments, you would be able to know uh, how, how your project is doing. What's the quality? How, how many tickets have they have develop, developed? So this, this takes away a lot of communication. Um, so the conclusion is by now if you could see the don'ts are uh, make an, e an excel spreadsheet with the project planning make a single page description of the project throw it over the wall and come back in one month to, uh, to see what's happened and expect to pay uh, $10 a day and then you will have the recipe of, of, of disaster so Offshore development is not about um, like making it easier or making it cheap. It's about being able to get resources when you need them. It's about um, you being able to structure your business so you can handle the demand without having to go through long time hiring of employees. You can hire at the shop we were, you can have two weeks notice, three weeks notice, one month notice. So you can really plan, if you have a Drupal project, you can plan, okay, I want a resource from March to June, 
and then I don't have any projects anymore, so I don't need the, the team anymore. So uh, it's not, not necessarily uh, a lot cheaper. If you want quality resources, you are going to, to pay for them as well. Uh, they are expen more expensive than junior resources here, but of course they are less expensive than senior resources here. But you have to calculate in the, um, the communication. So, conclusion, the conclusion of, of this talk is in fact, make sure you know why you are hiring offshore development, uh, so you do it for the right reasons. Select a partner that suits you, so that, that can um, give you the resources you need that fit into your workflow in your teams, that you have, you know you can uh, establish a personal relationship with. Provide them the correct tools, provide the correct infrastructure, and integrate the team in your company. And managing the team as if they were on your own desk is really the bottom line of this talk. So if you would do that, then you might be successful using offshore development. So if you have questions about the talk, then Go ahead. Yeah. What do you say to your customers? Do you do it in a transparent mode? Um, do you say that we work in an offshore mode? Yeah. What's Most their reaction? Their reaction, there is some skepticism, but if we explain how we approach the project and we can give our clients access to our Redmine, to our uh, deployment tool to our repository if they can see that actually uh, there is stuff being produced and they know uh, the setup we are doing it in and we can say like look because we do that we don't have to charge you that much because you can do it more cost effective if you have the right skills I think if you don't have the technical skills, it, it won't be that cost effective, but if you do have the technical skills, it, it becomes more cost effective. And you can also tell them like, look, because we don't have to make a long-term engagement right now in the setup of our company, we can offer you a better price. And most of them, most of them were okay with that. The so price is an issue. It's an issue, but it's an issue you should talk about. Yeah. No, no, but I think pricing is an, is an important factor for the end customer. Is that how much is the difference with local rates? Well, it depends on the length of the project. Um, if you just want to hire for a month, you're going to uh, pay steeper heights, then you can say, I'm hiring for six months. So um, the difference in the rates is about, I think, you can have junior developers from 130 euros a day and then senior resources you can hire from uh, 160, 170. Uh, if your notice period is very short, your rates will be higher. If your notice period is a lot longer, then you can, you can have the rates go down. So, yeah. Uh. Yeah. I can believe yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. First, take another one, then. Okay. <laughs> uh, what about support? Does, does anyone uh, accept the development support from the company that is in place? Yeah, well, um, in our company, that's not an issue because we are Drupal developers als ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we know how to support that code. Um, if you don't have that, then um, my first suggestion would be to to uh, to have also su a support contract with those developers. So you see, I talked about the skills. I think if you're lacking one of them, it becomes challenging. So that support is another another issue that that, that could be challenging because you don't lack one you lack one of the the skills, the technical skill. Uh, we are talking about a small uh, company uh, in Pakistan, 20 people.
how focused are they on quality? Are they working on processes? On, uh, do you know the concept of CMM and, and so on? Do they do well, that? actually, um, it's, it's you who decide what the quality process will be. So they deliver resources, but you define the process. So we've defined the process where we also hire a QA and they have to go in and check the developer's issues. And also um, the first project we did, we, yeah, we discovered a lot of issues, um, stuff they were doing like this, stuff we would like them to do like that. So you have a learning curve. But once you have done one or two projects, those guys, they, they develop like they would develop in your company. It's, it's like if you're trying to hire an offshore team, you should always think, from, if I hire a, a team here and I have three new guys in the company and I just let them start without telling about the company's process or the company's uh, way, ways of working, then... Yeah, well, they will do also do just what they think is right. So it's all about you defining the process. I just actually wanted to add a point to the gentleman's uh, question over right here. Uh, you asked previously about the uh, pricing. I'm trying to get you right here, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, also see, like, I, um, I think Don has made some excellent points in this uh, presentation about how to work with an offshoring company. Uh, also, he mentions offshoring, and I think when you say 130 a day, for, uh, sorry, uh, a month for, for the month, right? A day. A day, a day. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I should know this. Uh, 130 <laughs> a day uh, for a junior developer, uh, I think that is at cost, and that's probably in Pakistan. Uh, so when you bring up the pricing, and, and what pricing should cost compared to Belgian developers, don't forget the closer you get to Belgium, uh, the closer the culture is, of the time differences and the language as well. And uh, prices do go up, but I think you get a lot more out of it. Depending on the type of project, of course, uh, yeah. you get, can get a lot more out of it the closer you are to Belgium itself and still be near shoring, not offshoring in that case. Yeah. So just to you know, keep that in mind too. And of course, the past performance of the company too, and what type of projects they worked on is important as well. Yeah. Don't think you're throwing your project across the wall. You know, at the end of the day, I think a lot of people still think it's just that. You know, yeah. So there's also another thing to do with it. Yeah, exactly. So, my question is rather related to the other side. How easy is it to argue uh, a cost that is paid for an offshore company with the tax authority of Belgium? I don't know if you are aware, or if someone else in the company is doing that. How easy is the tax authority? accepted that the work you said, I mean, how do you justify? Because it's a very easy way of just taking all your profits out of Belgium. They usually it's, don't really it's, like it. Yeah. It's not that. It's not that hard. Like, normally, it depends how much of your development is. Like, because, well, okay, background story. I have a Belgian company. I have a Belgian company, but all the work we do is done in Hungary. Yeah. Right. So, if all your work is done, by another entity, and you're the owner also, you need some sort of um, transfer pricing. And then you have to set up uh, a reasonable a reasonable price um, that, that makes it fair to both countries and the amount of tax that you're paying in both countries. So for example, for us, um, um, like if, we, if we would charge to too little, the Hungarian authorities could say, you're creating off all the profit in Belgium and you're not paying anything here, so we decided that you have to pay this amount of money. Yeah. If we would pay uh, too much, then the Belgian authorities would say, like, hey, hey, what are you doing? You're shipping all your profits over there. Yeah. Now, to do that kind of stuff, uh, if it's your own company, like if you have both companies under your control, then you'll need to set up a sort of comparative study about what other companies are charging and how, what kind of transfer prices they are using. Mm -hmm. Normally your transfer prices should go both ways. So your safe transfer price that you're charging to Belgium should, should go the other way also. It's kind of tricky. And I, I guess with, with Pakistan it would be more hairy. Like we are in Europe, and there it's, um, there it's kind of like an equal kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but that's something yes, to, to, to watch out for. I think for, for this case, 
I don't know if it's even a problem, it's just resources. Yeah. And it's, it's another not, company. It's not his company. Yeah. yeah. No. That's the thing. There's a difference in importing services or exporting yeah. your product. Yeah. 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 And this is no just another company. That is, I don't think it's an issue if it's not your company. Exactly. Yeah. So that's it. What about the, the efficiency and the speed of development of those people compared to well, our people? Um, you do have a hit in efficiency. Yeah, I, I, what I, what I mean is yeah. uh, like you do have like a, a decrease in efficiency. They're not if they say a five-year development there. I think it's due to several reasons. It's due to the communication issue that you do have to. Sometimes stuff has to be adjusted. Like if you have a really good wireframe and functional analysis, it. It's adjustments. If you don't have um, stuff that's not been wireframed or not been functional analyzed, then you will sometimes have them rebuild stuff. Yeah. So, but, but you, they're pretty good. You, you can't know? say that they are fifty percent less efficient. No, 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 uh, not okay. at all. I think no. you lose like twenty or thirty percent due to the communication. But. After two projects, they exactly wanted it. How how uh, they exactly knew how we wanted to have the the project coded. The developers we got, they they were they could code. You know, they 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 do they did it like we did. So yeah. 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 Why did you choose Pakistan and not Hungary or Poland or even China? Well. Pakistan is definitely cheaper than Hungary. <laughs> it's cheaper, and uh, I think we've established a good relationship with the, the CEO there. Um, and yeah, he convinced us his, his shop was the best and was Drupal dedicated, and we gave it a, a shot, and it worked out. So, yeah. Um, so a problem with seniority in the development team in the offshore yeah, team? So can, can ask, my particular case was about my, uh, myself joining an offshore Yeah. So I was a new developer developer. Yeah. More or less on the side. And the offshore development was easy. And I had to help out in that project. As one more developer. But uh, all my advice would be disregarded. Which led to, even though well, I would try to add about it, such as we need version control. Yeah. And they wouldn't want to use it. Yeah. Because that's not the way it works. Okay, but and if you works this way, and I was wondering I think if you're facing those kind of issues, uh, you should select another partner. <laughs> no, 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 they have to be open to your process. And that's exactly what the, the CEO of the other company told me. Um, they have to follow your process. So it's you, you define the process. We deliver the resources, but you define the process. <laughs> yeah. Because when I started pointing out things that I think would improve the process or the way things were done, and they wouldn't add back, they would just say that that was not the way it was. And then my boss would jump in and say, things are done the way it is, and of course. Yeah, and well. If you just force them to work. No, 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 you, you, you don't should force anyone to do anything. You should just search a partner who, who wants to establish a, a, a relationship and wants to integrate into your process. If they don't see the benefits of that, then, then I don't, I, at least at our company, we don't want to work with them, you know.
Uh, yeah. Okay, that's it then. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you.